Welcome to the Boston Sea Rovers Career Opportunities Symposium. My name is Ted Maney. I'm faculty here at Salem State University, but I'm also a Boston Sea Rover. The Boston Sea Rovers is a very old dive club. We started in 1954. Um, and from the, from the start, we've always been about educating um, and increasing awareness in the marine environment. Uh, one of the things we have is a summer internship that we fund every year. And that is for um, people that are uh, 18 at the beginning of the internship and maximum 19. So high school seniors or actually beginning freshman students. And actually our first speaker today is a former intern. Uh, but what we're gonna do today is we have a select set of speakers that are gonna tell you about their careers and followed up with some question and answer sessions. So if you have questions for these speakers, uh, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A section and the speakers will answer those questions. Um, oh, we're right on time. All right, so first up, we have Rick Simon, who is one of our former Boston Sea Rover intern. Uh, he actually has his own dive business and he's a technical and commercial diver. And he's done a lot of uh, activities doing uh, exploring shipwrecks and maritime history, and also does some other uh, stuff in the commercial diving aspect. So Rick, you're up. Thank you so much for having me today uh, for comms. So as Ted said, I'm a commercial and a technical diver. So I dive for a living. And as a hobby, I started diving at a very young age. Um, and I've been lucky enough to travel all around the world now and, and dive some of the coolest shipwrecks that we have to offer. And I make my living under the ocean as a commercial diver. So I'm gonna talk to you first about commercial diving and what we do as commercial divers. And then we're gonna move in uh, to some of the fun stuff. So the first thing that commercial divers do is we do inspections. We inspect everything from water towers, water tanks. Uh, the pictures here are from a job where we were going into this caisson underground and inspecting a, a deep well, uh, looking for cracks, taking concrete core samples. So it varies from day to day what we do underwater. So as a commercial diver, you can't be claustrophobic. We climb through little hatches with heavy equipment on so we can go down and, and do these inspections. You also can't be afraid of heights. We climb up to the top of water towers and go through the tops of these tanks to inspect them. So even if you're in a city where there's no ocean or water in sight, there's always things that need diving and whether it's your local water tank, water towers, um, and then we dive in sewers. So we're, we're lucky enough to go from the beautiful, clean, warm water uh, to the not so clean brown water. Um, and in sewers, we're looking for cracks. There could be clogs in the sewer, um, a multitude of other problems that we have to go in and inspect. So a lot of times when we're diving in sewers, the only time that the flow is down is late at night or early in the morning. So we end up you know, getting into the water at you know, 2 a.m. sometimes so that they can do a full shutdown of a sewer system so we can swim up the sewer outfall, whether it's in a river um, or sometimes into the sound, depending on where those outfalls dump out at. We've uh, had some really cool projects lately, uh, working for the Navy, uh, burying some undersea mines offshore for uh, war games. Um, so here in the one photo, we're burying a mine and the other photo is a blue view sonar system going down and looking at the bottom composition. So as a commercial diver, a lot of times we're doing the diving work for the scientists who can't do that type of diving. So it's pretty interesting when you're working with scientists and balancing their needs for scientific data with the needs of actually being able to get the job done. 
So here again is us uh, burying some mines off the coast. Um, and it really depends on the weather. Some weather days are really nice and other times the boat's covered in ice and you're freezing cold and you don't really get to, to pick your weather, unfortunately. Here's a video of us deploying a World War II era floating mine off the coast of uh, Boston uh, for a war game. And it's really cool. So these are the big round floating mines that you always see in the movies. And as a diver, it's pretty cool to dive on one of these. You come up and you have an actual floating under mine. As commercial divers, we also do a lot of salvage work. So unfortunately, you know, we work in the ocean, people boat all over the ocean and, and ships tend to burn and sink now and then. So this is actually a pretty recent salvage we did this year of about an 80 foot mega yacht that caught on fire and sank off the Connecticut coast. Also after a hurricane, sometimes, you know, we go out and there'll be multiple salvages, multiple boats that sank and we come in with a crane and barge and pick up as many boats as we can to reduce the impact of oil, diesel in the water. Now, depending on the boat situation, they don't always pick them up from the bottom. Sometimes we just go down and we pump the oil off of the vessel um, and it's determined on a case by case scenario based off of the DEP and the Coast Guard's needs. So unfortunately, when it comes to salvage, they can be very challenging. So we might start at 5 a.m. in the morning on a salvage and might not finish till midnight by the time you actually get the vessel up and off the bottom. When you're on a salvage, we're dealing with multiple state agencies, whether it's the DEP, we can have the Coast Guard on site, we can have the state police, we can have fire marshals on site that all need to investigate the scene. But a lot of them don't dive and they're relying on us as the commercial divers to kind of go in the water, assess the scene, give them a report so that we can figure out what actually happened and why the vessel sank. This is an underwater photo of a 100 foot fishing vessel that sank off the Connecticut coast and was actually floating um, bow up stern into the mud. So, Unfortunately, as a commercial diver, we don't tend to have a lot of great visibility. Most of our work is done by feel um, or in the dark or the water um, you can't even see in. Sometimes we're not even diving in water. It could be paper pulp, uh, could be food waste sometimes in a digester tank. It really just depends on the job what water we're actually diving in. And I'm using the word water in quotations. Salvages are one of my favorite activities to do as a commercial diver because it's always a challenge. You never know what you're up against. Um, and as a passionate wreck diver, you don't get too often to dive on things that just sank. So it's always neat to dive on a vessel that just sank. So the next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is my passion. Um, so we're gonna go a little deeper and talk about technical diving and deep wreck diving. So as a wreck diver, I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and dive on shipwrecks. The photo you see here is actually from the shipwreck of the Britannic, which is Titanic's sister ship that sits off of Kia, Greece in about 400 feet of water. You can see the lifeboat davits up in the corner. And it's just an amazing experience being on a piece of history like a shipwreck like Britannic. When we're diving these deep shipwrecks, we're diving a system called a closed circuit rebreather. That system scrubs out the CO2 and adds oxygen back into the loop. So we're basically bubbleless. You can stay down for hours at a time. You can see here the divers using a diver propulsion vehicle to pull them around the wreck. Um, in this photo, we're at the bridge or the ship's helm area of Britannic. This is another photo from the Britannic of the one of the three ship's propellers. You can see the big propeller 
in the center of the screen. And then right off to the right hand side, you can actually see what would be the middle propeller of the wreck. Being a wreck diver and a technical diver, it allows us to see things that no one else can. This is another shipwreck off of Greece uh, called the Bordigalia. And this is one of the ship's guns. One of the things you have to realize when you're diving these ships is every environment is a little different. Every shipwreck is a little different. And most of our shipwrecks are either casualties of war, um, like the Bordigalia was sank during World War I, so you're really able to go down and visit and touch history when you're diving these vessels. We're doing these extreme dives that are deep, they're dark, and you have to have a great team of divers behind you. We're not just going and jumping in the water by ourselves. Um, generally speaking, we dive in pairs or in groups of three. Um, we're carrying a lot of heavy equipment and we're on a boat, sometimes miles offshore, hundreds of miles offshore, for three, four days at a time, and we have to be able to support ourselves. You know, it's almost like going to the moon when you're down there, um, but you're responsible for your own actions as a technical diver. So training is very important. We're diving, uh, sorry, we're diving specialized breathing gases of helium, oxygen, and nitrogen to eliminate a problem called narcosis as we go deeper. Just recently, about a uh, month ago, I was fortunate enough to be over in Ireland diving a wreck called the Lusitania. I don't know how many people are familiar with history, but the Lusitania was actually one of the vessels that got us into World War I. So the Lusitania had 1,201 people that perished when the vessel sank. It sank in just 18 minutes, 10 miles from shore off of Ireland. You had famous, the Vanderbilt's family was on board. And other famous families where a lot of people perished. And it was one of the, the driving factors that got us into World War I. So when we're down there and we're trying to take photos, as you can tell, these photos are much darker than the photos you saw on a ship like Britannic. So the environment can be much more challenging depending on where you are in the world. On Britannic, we had about 65 degree water. Here we had 48 degree water on the bottom. Um, our dives range from three to five hours, depending on what we're doing on the bottom. So we rely on technology such as rebreathers, heated undergarments to keep us warm and dry while we're diving. One of the, the things when diving a shipwreck like Lusitania, when you have such low visibility, you can't see the whole wreck. You don't have these grand images. What you have are pictures of the artifacts, the things that people touched on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's how you really connect with a shipwreck like this. So in this photo, we have one of the beautifully ornate windows from Lusitania. And you know, when you're, you're diving down there, you, you can't help but think about, you know, did one of the Vanderbilts touch this? Or, you know, how did this get here? Lusitania, when it was torpedoed, by a German U-boat was illegally carrying munitions um, on board. So certain parts of the wreck, and I don't have any photos of them, you will see bullets and, and other war items on board. So now we're gonna move from the nice waters of Ireland to right off the Eastern coast. So when we're on shipwrecks, we're not the only ones there yet giant lobsters. And a lot of people don't know, especially if you're from New England, that we had U-boats right off our coast. So the photo on the right is off the U-853, right off of Block Island, Rhode Island, nine miles from our coast. And people don't realize that the war was fought right off our coast. And these are the things that allow us to touch history. You know, as a wreck diver, as a technical diver, you can go down and visit these sites which is pretty rare to be able to go and experience something on your own. So, you know, we've gone down, we've done this really deep technical dive and now we've got to come up. 
So at different portions on the way up, we have to stop and decompress. So as we go down, our body on gas is nitrogen or another inert gas, could be helium. On the way up, we have to off gas so we don't get something called the bends. So we have different stops at, at different depths um, so that we can off gas and come up safely and, and not have any issues. So for a 20 minute dive on the bottom, it might take you three hours to get to the surface. Um, and that's a pretty boring three hours. Uh, if you don't have friends or, or something to do, you learn how to pass the time on decompression, think about the dive. Sometimes you're reviewing photos. But you can see in this photo that we have our divers who are wearing our closed circuit with breathers on our back. And then on the side of the divers, we have our, our bailout tanks. So if our rebreather does fail, we have a full backup and full redundancy to get ourselves out of the water and through our decompression stage of the dive. We have teams for a reason. We rely so heavily on each other in the water to look after us because we can't communicate with the boat. So when we're in the water, it's our team that's helping us through every stage of those dives. So I can't stress the team aspect of technical diving enough. We're not jumping in the water by ourselves to do these dives. It's a tremendous effort by a large group of people to get us onto these shipwrecks. So you're in the water for five hours, you know, you gotta hydrate. Um, so this is Joe Maserani on one of our trips, drinking out of his camel pack um, on our decompression. So, you know, just like we drink on the surface, you can drink underwater. Um, Gatorade is great. Uh, we can eat underwater. Peanut M&Ms are delicious on decompression. You just take your loop out of your mouth, uh, take a sip or, or eat an M&M. I like to call them deco pills. Um, I never miss a meal. So it's really important that uh, we stay hydrated on these dives. So hydration is actually the number one cause of something called DCS. So if you get dehydrated, you know, we're not off gassing properly and then we can get the bends. So I always get asked, why do we do what we do? So here's a group of, of divers. Um, we had just come back from a trip from the Andrea Doria, which is a shipwreck that actually another friend of ours, John Moyer owns. It went down in the 650s um, off of Martha's Vineyard. And if you're able to make it to the Boston Sea River show this weekend, we have a whole exhibit on the 65th anniversary of the Andrea Doria sinking. But this is the foghorn that was raised, recovered, and now we have since sounded off from that shipwreck. We had beautiful China that came up, a telephone, so we do this for the history to connect with it. Salvage is a touchy subject on a shipwreck like the Andrew Dory that is owned. It's very easy to salvage artifacts, restore them and put them in museums or in collections. Other shipwrecks, it's really hard like the Britannic and the Lusitania, they wanna bring artifacts up and put in a museum. But because of the government's owning the shipwreck, there being owners involved, it's a very difficult process to bring artifacts up to preserve and restore. So I'm gonna show a film that we premiered at the Boston Sea Rovers Film Festival a couple years ago that's all about diving, technical diving on Britannic. Each time a wreck diver descends into the darkness and lays eyes on a shipwreck, he experiences a ghost-like connection to the past. The lure of sunken vessels is that when they plummet to the bottom of the ocean, their stories and their secrets go with them. Like the hulks of metal themselves, such secrets wait patiently for those who are curious enough to come along and discover them. Britannic, the largest ship of her day, sister to Titanic. A 100 foot tall and 900 foot long behemoth that has been resting on her starboard side at the bottom of the Aegean Sea for more than 100 years. Sea Rover members Jacques Cousteau and Doc Edgerton discovered her in 1976. Since then, fewer than 100 divers have visited her, 
not only because access to the wreck is guarded by the Greek government, but because only the most experienced technical divers can reach her 400-foot depth. HMHS Britannic is the third vessel in White Star Line's Olympic class, a class that included Olympic and the famed Titanic. Britannic never knew the luxury of her sister because she was requisitioned by the British Royal Navy as a World War I hospital ship shortly after her launch in 1914. On November 20th, 1916, Britannic struck a mine laid by a German U-boat. The blast flooded six of Britannic's watertight compartments. It took her less than an hour to sink. In May of 2019, a team of divers set out to explore Britannic, 104 years after her sinking and more than 40 years since Cousteau first laid eyes on her. Among them were sea rovers Rick Simon and Joe Mazrani. They went to marvel at this legendary wreck, to connect with her history, and to join the ranks of the few who have reached her. But they had their own mystery to solve. One born in 1976, and very much connected to the rovers who had visited Britannic before them. Before either Rick or Joe were born, Cousteau, Edgerton, and a team of divers from the Calypso made 68 dives to the wreck. Each time they surfaced, they brought with them priceless artifacts. If sea rovers are anything, they are secret hunters. Rick and Joe Wreck divers who cut their teeth in the waters of the North Atlantic not only hunt secrets, they hunt treasure. It was only natural that the mystery they wanted to solve involved artifacts. Whispers about artifacts taken from Britannic by Cousteau have echoed across generations of divers, with much speculation surrounding the ship's bell. The bell is the heart of a ship. It signals the watch, rings for ceremonies, and of course, sounds the alarm. The bell sounded when Britannic struck the mine and signaled to all on board that the ship would soon sink. It was likely the last man-made sound anyone heard before the sea swallowed her in a thunderous clap. Bells are the highest prize for shipwreck hunters, and this one, the bell of a ship, that was not only the largest of its day, but Titanic's twin sister would have been a crown jewel for an explorer like Cousteau. Some say Cousteau raised the bell and kept it in his private collection. Others say he took it to a museum in Athens or elsewhere in the world. Cousteau was silent on the subject. Cousteau's adventures mesmerized Rick and Joe as children. As adults, who now discover and salvage shipwrecks, they often wonder if the rumors were true. Britannic's owner, Simon Mills, wondered too. He told the divers, when I die and go to heaven, the one question I want to ask Cousteau is, what did you do with Britannic's bell? Joe and Rick enjoyed five dives on Britannic in spectacular conditions, but they were still plagued by one question. Did Cousteau raise the ship's bell and hide it away? They spent their sixth and last dive trying to find out. Rick and Joe knew where the bell should be, right above the crow's nest, halfway up the main mast. The main mast is broken, but still attached to the ship with the topmost part resting in the sand, like a massive tree felled in a storm. The pair dropped into the water and first went to the bow, where they posed to pause with Sea Rover flag number two. From there, they went straight towards the mast. The divers searched the area of the crow's nest, but the bell was nowhere to be found. As Rick ascended to photograph the ship from above, Joe remained at the crow's nest and descended, doing his best to draw a line from where the bell should have been to the sand below.
<laughs> Sorry. In his final dive on Britannic, Joe cleared the name of one of the club's most beloved members. The team spoke with Mills in the days that followed to tell him yet another Britannic mystery had been solved. Simon's response was simple. I guess when I get to heaven, I owe Jacques Cousteau an apology. So that's why we go and we dive shipwrecks for the history, for the personal challenge. It's really hard um, to put into words when you're on one of these vessels, what it's actually like to be there in person and experience it. On a wreck like Britannic or, or Lusitania or even the shipwrecks of our coast, every shipwreck tells a story and every story is different. Some are happy stories, some are sad stories. Um, but they're all important stories to our history. And as a wreck diver and as a technical diver, we're able to experience that for ourselves. And then furthermore, as a commercial diver, you know, every day we're in the water and you might be on a simple inspection in an area like Mystic, Connecticut, and you're finding old bottles or other things that help us connect um, to the past. All right, welcome back. Our next speaker in our series is uh, Holly Bourbon who's currently at the National Aquarium. She's a Boston Sea Rover and also a member of the Women Divers Hall of Fame. And she's gonna to talk to us about aquarium diving careers. Morning, everybody. Whoa, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, welcome everybody. I wanna thank Ted and Salem State and the Rovers. And I'm always excited to come back to the Northeast. I live in Maryland now, but I um, actually am a New Englander. Um, so I love coming back here for this show. Sorry, let me take this off too. So I am going to talk to you about aquarium diving careers. Um, Rick, uh, which is really which is cool about Rick, is he was one of the early interns that actually spent some time with me when I was at the New England Aquarium. I actually started my career at the New England Aquarium. I won't go back into the years, but it was pretty much my uh, first full-time job out of college. There you go. Thank you very much. So that was all me, my face. So what I want to just quickly start with is my background, and I'm certainly going to focus on the uh, career positions I've had, but um, where I'm resting now for my title is Director of Dive Programs at the National Aquarium. So I'm also a dive safety officer. And basically, you know, I'll, there's different pathways to get to where I am, including I have colleague friend of mine at various aquariums who actually uh, have commercial backgrounds who are actually diving safety officers, several of them, in fact, at the Georgia Aquarium. So I began my career path pretty much while I was at college. I went to Mount Holyoke College in South Hadley, Mass. I actually did an off-campus internship, and that was with the New England Aquarium. And I worked with primarily the penguins, but uh, also Head Start Ridley turtles. Excuse me for a second. Okay, thank you again. So again, I pretty much started out my career path while I was at college, you know, my extra my sophomore year, we we're doing an off campus internship It was actually required of me. And I uh, spent pretty much January intern at the New England Aquarium again working with penguins I was not certified to dive at the time, as well as Head Start Ridley Turtles and River Otters I actually worked with the dive team because they were pretty much the wet aquarists who actually worked with the penguins. Um, so upon my graduation, literally a month after graduating, I got a dive job um, with the aquarium. I was an aquarist uh, with diving as a main focus. I worked with the giant ocean tank as well as a penguin exhibit. Um, 
a, after numerous years, I think it was four years, I then was promoted to a senior aquarist. At this time, I, I was obviously certified to dive. I actually got certified to dive at UMass Amherst when I was at Mount Holyoke. And I spent about almost 20 years of my career at New England. And then I moved on to the Division of Marine Fisheries as the dive safety officer, because um, I actually had that uh, dual title when I left New England, as you can see about on, the, on the line. And then I was also a biologist. And then at National Aquarium in 2012, I was hired as the curator of fishes, which meant I dealt with all the husbandry aspects of the animals on Pier 3 and Pier 4. And I uh, was curator of fishes, DSO. And presently, I'm the director of dive programs. Um, on a good year, uh, National, we can do, this is pre-COVID, over 6,600 in-house dives. That's not including any outside dives. We have about 21 exhibits we dive and or snorkel in. So there is a lot of in-house diving going on. So thus uh, the need for my position. And I actually have four ADSOs or assistant dive safety officers that work under me. Um, as Ted, Ted mentioned, I'm a Boston Sea Rover member long-term. I'm a dive instructor as well as a DAN instructor and a PSI PCI. Uh, Ted mentioned again, Women Divers Hall of Fame, and also I'm part of a board for the Association of Diving Program Administrators, as well as a reef surveyor for the reef program. Um, so you're basically just seeing some various pictures of the uh, things that I've been involved with. So give you a little background about the National Aquarium, just to position you. It is actually designed by the same architect that designed New England Aquarium. Um, while it may look a bit different in the photos you're seeing from New England, it's got very similar features when you go inside. It can be a little eerie. Some of the things like the skeleton of a whale hanging, again, if you know New England at all. Um, again, New England was uh, built in 69. National Aquarium opened in August of 81. Uh, so there are actually two piers, three and four. I'm predominantly on three as far as my office, but there's diving at all the locations. The bottom picture actually shows our animal care and rescue center that was newly built a couple of years ago. And that's where we have stranded animals, uh, primarily uh, seals, but we also where we bring all of our animals, our fish, uh, reptiles, other animals in and before they go on to the exhibit or the habitats. Uh, we get over a million or about a million and a half visitors per year. There's over 2 million gallons of water at the facility. Uh, all the water is actually made. We have to actually make the salt water. There's more than 17,000 species represent, sorry, 17,000 specimens representing 700 species, 750 species. And we are a uh, association of zoo and aquariums accredited facility and we're a nonprofit. So there's the background. Uh, to give you an idea of the various exhibits or habitats we have, and this is just a glimpse with some of the pictures. We have um, our mission to start is to inspire conservation of the world's aquatic treasures. We obviously have uh, habitats, exhibits that you know, uh, are very educational. We have a very robust conservation program um, and the various main exhibits or habitats. We have the upland tropical rainforest. We have a multiple story Atlantic coral reef, which is that upper right hand picture you're seeing um, the young girl and the um, other person standing looking at. It's about four stories. We have a shark alley Atlantic predators. That's a, it's basically what we call a ring tank setup, and you basically spiral down the outside of it um, like a racetrack and down you drop into Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic predators. We also have Black Tip Reef, which was built in 2013. I was pretty much brought in as a curator to open that exhibit, as well as close the old, what they called wings on the water exhibit. We have the Australia Wild Extremes, uh, Marine Mammal Pavilion at Pier 4. We have our bottle, bottlenose dolphins. That's the lower right picture you're seeing. And we also have a jellies exhibit, as well as I mentioned earlier in the photo that I showed you just a moment ago, the Animal Care and Research Center, which is off-site. We also have a building where a lot of our other offices reside, much like New England has a similar setup uh, that's on, we call it our Canva building, where we have a, a floor with the various other folks that work at the aquarium. So very dive specific positions or opportunities. This is obviously a career segment, so I want to touch on obviously my career and how I made sort of my pathway. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I have friends who have a more commercial background, uh, myself like an, a, a dive instructor background, a, a aquarist or husbandry person. You also get life support folks, technicians who also have a, can often have the dual title of dive safety officer. So um, I'm the director of dive programs as mentioned. Uh, I have my most senior is a senior assistant dive safety officer. And then I have the various other assistant safety officers that work with me. Uh, one of them has a focus on volunteer dive coordinator. We have at present 
we, we have about 100 volunteers now, but when I began, we had over 180 volunteer divers. We have a dive training coordinator and an equipment coordinator. And then um, that's my team with our trusty mannequins that we use for an incredible amount of our training, Robbie and Randy. And we also, the bottom picture shows a recruitment day for new volunteers that we, we hold every couple of years. And we have a whole variety of volunteer divers that come from all walks of life that are um, crucial to, like a lot of aquariums, crucial to our operations, especially around animal care and maintenance of the exhibits and cleaning. So here just gives you a look um, you know, at the various positions within our animal care and welfare department. So as I mentioned, my, I really started out and I pointed this out to people as an aquarist. The dive safety officer position um, came about pretty much, um, I saw a need for safety in the husbandry area at New England. I was an avid diver. I mean, the fact, I love the job I have because it marries two things. It marries the fact that I love to dive and then I can take that and marry that task with our the work with the animals, the marine animals, which makes it even a, a neater and cooler job. That's really what's hooked me. Um, I actually started out on a pre-vet track at Mount Holyoke, bio, you know, again, a biology major. And once I got hooked on the New England Aquarium, as far as the aquarist work, I really stuck with that path and just kept my foot in the door. I kept coming back as an intern. I volunteered and then I actually worked on the whale watch boat as a whale watch naturalist and mate. Um, until it brought me up to when the position opened up uh, for me as a full-time diver. So we have, I get mentioned volunteers, we have aquarist, other position aides. We have, as mentioned, life support engineers, veterinary department, a whole animal health department, animal rescue and rehab for our turtles and seals. We have aviculturists, herpetologists, horticulturists. So we touch on reptiles, plants, um, the variety of the aquarists, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a track to senior aquarists, which is what I left with when I left New England. Then there's assistant curators, managers, our registrar, uh, who does a lot of tracking of our animal acquisitions and such and permits. We have folks, again, as I mentioned, who are um, in the various areas, curators. So again, more management level for Animal Care and Rescue Center, Australia Rainforest, Blue Wonders, which is uh, former name was Fishes Department and our marine mammals. And then we have the director level. And then we, uh, uh, my boss is the VP of Animal Care and Welfare. So again, give you a track. I really, I put this picture in from a previous talk to just talk about the role of a DSO. And I can see Ted shaking his head up and down. Basically, this is to show you that a dive safety officer, much like an Aquarius, can wear a multitude of hats. It's astounding. When you really look at the various, and again, I'm not expecting you to look at the fine print, but it just can show you the various things we do, such as program administration, obviously equipment, um, animal life support, as I mentioned, life support technicians can also have the dual job of dive safety officer. I know uh, several folks who have the, that kind of career path. We do a lot of management. I would say the biggest thing we do is risk management for our institutions as dive safety officers. And I will tell you in the years that I've been involved with this dive safety officer group called ADPA, um, I have watched the field grow as far as number of women in the field. I probably started out as one of the few dive safety officers at an aquarium. And now I would say we're close to over a third of a of a over hundred member group that are actually uh, women who are managing programs and aquariums and zoos. Obviously I'm focusing a lot on aquariums, but there are a lot of zoos with small programs as well because they have diving on site. This word cloud I did again with a, for folks to just show you again, the multitude of things we do. And I think this is part, another reason why I like the job I have so much. Um, a lot of the specialty I also had at New England was I would, uh, I ran the member sponsored collecting expeditions where we'd go and collect fish out on trips with the, with uh, public folks who go would come with us. We teach them how to collect fish for the giant ocean tank. We do less of that at national. We do source uh, our fish from various collectors, whether in the Florida Keys or other areas, depending on the need we have. Um, so I've got that also in my sort of back pocket and I do spend, I am lead on quite a few catches when we need to do things for animal health at National and help train other staff. But you can see safety is a big one, management, um, records. Um, the joke is sometimes that DSO doesn't mean diving safety officer, it means diving seldom officer because sometimes we can get caught up in a lot of the documentation dry training and all that. So I know probably Ted has that going on and other safety officers and you get your really Jones to get be in the water and dive because that's truly what we love to do. 
And basically, I just want to go over this, not to go into the whole fine print, but we do have to follow standards, including OSHA, which is workplace safety. Um, that's uh, what pretty much you saw Rick doing um, in his commercial diving and technical diving is also mandated by OSHA. But we also couple our work at the aquarium with scientific uh, diving, and that's really for the feeding part of it. Um, and then the recreational part of it, I actually just did a little bit of that this week. I was hosting a, um, a couple divers from an engineering group that needed a tour, our exhibits to look at concrete inspections. They were diving in a uh, commercial or OSHA mode, and we were actually more of in a touring mode. But we, you know, I do bring VIPs in, our CEO of the aquarium dives. So we also, uh, you know, use our instructor certification in that realm as well. Um, so just to give you a track of how we treat our diving um, and other aquariums will do something similar. We're a mixed model is basically what I'm getting at. So the Atlanta Coral Reef is um, the exhibit where we actually have a guest program when it's running right now it's suspended. Um, but I'm going to show you know this is a the, the four story, it, this, it seems like it's a lot deeper but it's 13 feet in depth it's about 335,000 gallons. It's in a, like a ring tank. You walk through the middle of it. It's again Atlantic species. Uh, we do have some small sharks and a mori in there, and a whole variety of Atlantic tropical fish, including a very large tarpet. Um, this just gives you an idea of the 21 exhibits and whoops, and um, the kind of diving that goes on. This again was pre-COVID, but it really shows you that the Atlantic coral reef is the main focus of most of the diving on Pier 3. And that's because that's where our volunteer divers also help us. That's the one exhibit they go into and they help feed and clean. And by cleaning, I mean everything from vacuuming the crushed media at the bottom to cleaning the acrylics to helping feed the fish um, several times a week. Um, the next highest is the Black Tip Reef exhibit. That was the one that was uh, opened in 2013. It's our Indo-Pacific exhibit, uh, a lot heavier in elasmobranchs, sharks and rays. In fact, it's named after the Black Tip Reef sharks we have in there. We presently have eight. So you can see those two exhibits really comprise the majority of what we do for diving. Um, but we've got some really cool variety. It is an older aquarium, so it is challenging to, do, to work through some of the things we try to do. This is just to give you an idea of the multitude of um, tasks we work on. Again, we have everything from pressure washers we use to equipment maintenance, to our compressed air system, to lots of equipment. Um, the upper right is actually our Amazon River Forest exhibit where we do um, some snorkeling for cleaning, just stand up snorkeling basically. And then you can see there's some various vacuuming uh, tasks. So my team does all of this work. We just don't manage it. We actually go in and dive and do this work <clears throat> with the husbandry teams. And we have a, you know, probably six groups we're working with, including our own. Habitat extraction trainings are probably our biggest focus. Um, I think the biggest risk we manage as dive safety officers is if we have an unconscious diver in the water. And so you're seeing a variety of pictures of us working with our mannequins in various exhibits. The uh, habitats, excuse me, um, some of them because they're older can be incredibly challenging. So we have to come up with various tools. The middle picture is one of our mannequins we're using on a catwalk in our shark exhibit. It has no, it has public viewing through the middle of it and some windows on the outside, but there's, you basically have to walk inside of it on what's called a catwalk. And that catwalk you can see is not that wide. And in order to get divers out of the water in certain spots, we have egress railings, and we have to actually put those folks in a, in a roll up net, like you do on a boat, on like a gunnel of a boat and roll somebody up and over onto that um, platform. And then we can use different boards potentially in various locations to move someone. So again, our biggest risk is certainly um, our extraction trainings, and that's where a real big focus is right now for my team because we have so many exhibits. We're trying to build out training templates and, and training for all the staff that dive. Another picture, just showing you some other extractions on the um, your um, left hand side. That's our black tip reef deep dive. Us working with extraction there. Uh, the middle picture, something similar. In our Amazon River Forest, it's probably uh, for a rating. It's a really hard extraction. We literally have to lift somebody over a fake log. Um, and that log is there because there are caimans uh, in one section, it's called section C. So, and this has about 40 feet of an 18 inch river rock bed that you have to literally carry an unconscious person down to get them out a set of a platform, out a set of stairs, out to a door to be able to eat meat with EMS as, as well as uh, get that secondary level of first aid. Uh, the top one, you're seeing with that ladder, that's one of our other Australia exhibits. So again, you can see challenges trying to get somebody over up and over acrylics. We also get to work with the media. Uh, just we opened Black Tip Reef. Uh, you're seeing the gentleman with the microphone. That's our CEO, and that's the, at that time Stephanie Rawlings Blake was our mayor in Baltimore. 
We are doing the ribbon cutting ceremony for Black Tip Reef. I'm actually one of the divers in the water holding that pontoon boat. So we're actually over an exhibit with all the different animals in it, you know, uh, basically doing the opening ceremony. We do Santa diving <laughs> for the media. We do pumpkin carving. Uh, we do commercial, we do uh, full face mask educational programs. You can see the bottom right picture has, actually we train our volunteers to do that. We do a little bit of field diving right now. I hope to expand that program. That's actually um, uh, in the Florida Keys there in a quarry. That's our CEO and my senior ADSO. Um, they're investigating that area for the possible move for the dolphins in the future from our Pier 4 facility. And then we hosted um, Sam from Nat Geo. Uh, what Sam sees is a show on Saturday mornings. And so we do get to host some celebrities as well. So it's really fun because we have such a good variety of things. Loads of maintenance. It never really ends. Everything from scrubbing to working with teams that are actually fixing something not in the water, but that gentleman suspended. He's suspended over Black Tip Reef, and we're looking into Shark Alley uh, Atlantic Predators. He's actually fixing our, fixing our wave wall. And then various tools we use. We have a remora scrub unit on the acrylic you're seeing. I'm actually in that lower right hand picture um, looking at that shark catwalk because we're trying to work on some extraction training. And then the top right is actually our pier for dolphin exhibit or pool. It's called the exhibit pool. That is by far our largest body of water at 750,000 gallons and it's the deepest at 23 feet. We do not dive with the dolphins free swimming. They are usually in, our, in their holding pools when we're in there, but there is various maintenance we're doing, working on with our facilities team and our life support team. Husbandry tasks. Those are constant. Uh, my team, like I said, is involved, especially me. That's me in the upper Left there, um, you can see the big net. We're actually catching out fish that we need to take out of the exhibit to um, send to another institution. We've got Calypso, unfortunately, our, our, lo our lovely turtle, our lo very large green sea turtle who passed away not long ago. She's getting an exam, so she's in that big box getting lifted out with a winch. We you know, release fish in that are, are new. You can see the middle picture. And then that other picture you're seeing with the blue tarp and it, we call it the H bar or T bar. That is actually was used to pull out very large rays we have in the black tip reef exhibit. So lots and lots of variety. Uh, we never get done training. We not only train divers in the water, we do a lot of training for first aid CPR and divers let network is who we pretty much use. Uh, for our training on all the staff, all the volunteers, and that's on a two-year cycle. I mentioned recruitment earlier. So every couple of years, we bring in some new volunteers, depending on the need, and that's us at the University of Maryland um, using their pool for swim tests and some more training at the bottom for the DAN class. And so confined space, that is pretty much everywhere in the aquarium, uh, anything that can be a water hazard where somebody can drown. And so you're seeing on the left-hand side, you are seeing... Uh, that is us carrying our mannequin down that walkway, which is like it's 20 feet one way, 20 feet at an angle um, to get that injured diver. Again, this is simulated, um, but practicing this to, to get an unconscious diver or, or, or hurt diver out of that space. Very, very challenging that space uh, of all of them. And then we um, do use ferno baskets or an extraction basket. That's actually in our Shark Alley Atlantic Predators pool. So we actually have four egress locations in that space. And so depending on where you are and what the dive entails, that is one of the ways we get a diver who could be unconscious um, or say they can't climb a ladder to get out. That's how we'll get them out is with that basket. And then again, some more of the um, RF exhibit just because that, is a, that, that was a, definitely a big work in progress to get that done. So what I wanna do now is to get away a little bit from the, the training, training, training you're saying is I, uh, we did a virtual dive for World Oceans Day. And so I'm going to, hopefully I'll have the sound off. I'm gonna just get this dive up, bring you on a dive with me in Black Tip Reef. And you can see it's a little over six minutes, just to give you an idea of what it's like that full screen, I think I'm still okay. So this is Black Tip Reef. This is the newest of the three, uh, there's the ring tanks of Black Tip Reef. Again, I'm saying new, but 2013 is already clearly eight years ago. Oh yeah, I should have expanded, thank you. Stop and reshare, okay, thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Okay, so black tip reef again. Um, or media person um, diving with me. This is an Indo-Pacific reef. It's about 270,000 gallons. The upper reef crest is um, about seven feet in depth. Then we have a deep dive, which is, is only about 17, 18 feet, but that's considered the deep dive in this um, space. Again, the newest, it's probably got over 700 animals, maybe close to 75 to 80 species. Um, this is where our green sea turtle Calypso used to be. Unfortunately, she passed away. So we, are, um, we don't have a turtle in there. So what you're seeing is me actually heading over the deep dive. Sorry, we're just doing some technical admits. Thank you. Um, over the deep dive, and that animal I was just looking at was actually our Queensland grouper, Bertha. She's a, a main core resident. You're also seeing now a reticulated ray come through. The coral you're seeing is actually not real. It's all fabricated like any of our other large habitats do not have real coral, but there is over anywhere from 3,500 to 4,500 pieces of fabricated coral actually molded from real coral pieces and, and painted to, to look like it. It's astounding. Um, the fish also believe, you know, clearly they can't eat it and pick at it like they would on a real reef unless it's algae growing on top. Um, but it's very realistic. So you'll get animals laying eggs and such. This is Zoe, our resident female zebra shark. And she's one of two we have in there presently, a long nose hawkfish. So we may have some things that could grow to nine feet being birthless. She's probably five feet, that grouper, to that very small, maybe three inch hawkfish. Um, so we have a whole variety, just like a real reef system. Uh, this is sort of like a car wash <laughs> um, where the fish really like the feel of that crushed media over them. Um, it's fun for us because then we get to check out the fish, look at them closer, see how they're doing. Um, as you can see, Bertha sort of is making her way around the uh, habitat. We also have a humphead wrasse that just went by. Again, I'm just trying to give you a whole sense of how uh, neat it is because we've got the three large reticulated rays. We've got a black blotch fantail rays or four rays. Um, we've got two zebra sharks. You saw their Zoe earlier in the, a moment. And now where I'm actually going through some confined space. Um, it's really neat because it's, again, it's trying to simulate a, a reef you'd actually dive on, you know, if you were in Australia, Indo-Pacific zone. Um, a whole lot of tangs and surgeons and snappers. We've got blue, uh, green chromis, a panther, a uh, little panther grouper here. Um, they, they're, a lot of the fishes you would imagine, they're hand fed and they're also top side fed, are very acclimated to the um, divers. So they like to come up, they like to check us out. Many of them are in fact, very curious. Um, cameras will entice them. Uh, Calypso, when she resided in here, that green sea turtle, she would love to come up to divers and check out things. In fact, she'd wanna nip at things, some things at times. Um, this is a magenta dotty back, little tiny sort of purplish looking fish. Again, to show you, we can have everything from a five foot tiny fish for variety to the grouper to we've got uh, over five foot long black tip reef sharks. And you're not seeing them as prevalent in here because I'm probably bigger than the shark, sharks in general, you can see one right there. Um, and also our bubbles uh, do, you know, keep them away a little bit. Presence of divers, you know, we're bigger and we're a bit noisy. So the black tips tend to congregate and stay in their school in areas and they exhibit away from us. This is one of our larger Wobegong carpet sharks. It's our tasseled. Um, she's amazing and she doesn't look like that because she's sitting there not doing much, but this is an ambush predator like, and then here's another one who's our smaller ornate. These animals lie in wait and when a fish comes by, you know, they've got like a Siri on their, on their faces, they will basically suck them in. It's the most uh, incredible feeding. Uh, we actually feed that larger tassel you saw a moment ago, um, including this one on a very, like a five foot long feeding taunt because the strike is so in, in crazy strong that it could, you know, really hurt a diver if we were trying to hand feed. Um, reticulated rays again, you're seeing Zoe again. We now have another um, zebra shark in here. We didn't have it there at the time named Zuri, a younger one. So she, she's stunning. Um, spiny chromis here, just to give you an idea of what this exhibit looks like underwater. You know, the public gets to clearly see everything from top side and underwater viewing, but the beauty of just this is like a real reef system. Um, we go in here, we do scrub the corals, we use a pressure washer, we vacuum the bottom. 
Um, you're also seeing now Sina. She's our hump head rash. She's in an intermediate phase. She is pretty much started out as a female a hermaphrodite and she's going to, as she enlarges, she will turn into a male hump head rash, which at the very end, I'll show you what she will look like because it's astounding the transformation that we get to watch on these animals. So lots of biology going on. Um, you know, the aquarist definitely take notes, feeding records, um, all those kind of things you'd expect somebody to do when they're taking care of um, actual animals. Um, so very intensive work caring for these animals, you know, and this is one of three large exhibits on Pier 3. Um, I was in here just uh, Wednesday morning. Yeah, Wednesday morning I was in here. I took these uh, engineers to come in to go inspect our concrete because that's another part of what we do. And a quick topside view, and then I'm getting back to the dive platform. So it's just about over. But again, to give you an idea what it's like to dive in these habitats, it's really cool. It's obviously, as you can see, very different than Rick's work where he's got very shallow work going on. I mean, I've got very shallow work going on where he's obviously got his technical deep diving on the various shipwrecks. So I'm just, if I can get us back to the PowerPoint. Could you help me for a second? Let's see if I can. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. There we are. Great. Thank you. So back out. So you got to see a lot of what we got to dive with. Tarpon, as I mentioned, uh, upper left. You saw the tassel will be gong, that's uh, bottom left. In that middle top picture, you're seeing Cena is the smaller of the fish with the yellow outlined caudal fin, caudal tail. Um, Tang, who was our larger uh, humphead wrasse, who unfortunately he passed, was an older animal. That is what Cena will look like. So you will see a transformation from a female to an intermediate to that very large male hump pad. He was astounding. He was a, like almost a bit like a dog. He would hang out with you when you're diving. He would follow you around. He was a really cool animal. Calypso, I haven't talked a lot about her because it's the best picture I've got of her probably in here or one of them. She was a rescue animal. Um, I want to see she stranded off the coast of uh, Long Island. I think at Long Island, New York. She was a cold stunned animal, which will happen to animals where they almost get hypothermic. In order to save her, they had to remove her, uh, her left flipper. And you would never know it because the animal could maneuver just as well without that flipper as she, you know, even if she had it, but an amazing animal, about 500 pounds, very, you know, similar species or same species as Myrtle is at the New England Aquarium, a little bit bigger animal, but not quite as heavy in weight. She's probably about 500 pounds. Another uh, top view is a hogfish. We've had those in the Atlantic coral reef. And then we got a puffer and um, sweet lips uh, species that were in the black tip reef exhibit that bottom right. And some other cool ray shots I've already mentioned, puffer fish, green morays, our map puffer named Duncan, middle bottom, and then a golden tail moray, just to get, again, the whole variety. And I've obviously seen a lot of fish from the video. So, you know, again, if you're looking for a career where you like to marry, um, you know, the safety aspect of what you do, um, or aquarist work, again, obviously aquarium or zoo life, um, for, again, people at zoos do diving to take care of whether it's penguin exhibits or other habitats that they work with. You know, we do, when we dress up for Halloween, it's what you're picturing, seeing pirates of the Caribbean theme, um, pumpkin carving, I mentioned. We also do host, we hosted wounded warriors in the past. This was my predecessor, uh, deep dive safety officer Chuck had hosted, but we brought the Navy in. So we do do other media events and such. Um, you know, depending on the time of the year. So we collaborate with a lot of various stakeholders at the National Aquarium, as far as, you know, promoting our, our brand and what we do as a conservation education organization. So to final, you know, get through the remaining of this talk, just want to talk to you about some resources. This is a bonnet head shark that's, his name is Forrest. He's uh, right now off site at the off care, off site care facility. Um, he, he normally resides in Atlantic Coral Reef. We're just doing a treatment. So he's off exhibit. And just to mention a few other uh, groups, and this is certainly not everything you can find, but a lot of the groups that I've known and have am familiar with, whether they're scholarships or other opportunities. Um, Ted mentioned, I am a member of the Women Divers Hall of Fame since 2007. One of the other speakers, Faith, uh, you're gonna see coming up is also a member, an amazing group of women, uh, a tremendous amount of scholarships that you could apply for, for various things. We've got uh, the Boston Sea Rovers, of course, who are hosting. 
the American Academy of Underwater Sciences. Um, you know, Ted's program, like mine, has, is a scientific standard we do our diving under. You've got obviously National Aquarium, New England Aquarium, lots of aquariums around the country and worldwide, Divers Let Network. Our World Underwater Scholarship has a year long um, Rolex uh, sponsored scholarship, another amazing opportunity. Um, American Academy of Underwater Scientists, I don't want to be remiss, they also uh, offer scholarships and, and also uh, there's some intern opportunities with the various groups. ADPA is the group I've been involved with for 25 years now, where it's a, a diving safety officer group that is like a, it's like a family, a network of folks that I rely on heavily for, you know, best practices. And, you know, these are friends of mine who I've known for years and running dive and zoo, uh, aquarium and zoo um, programs. The Association of Zoo and Aquariums, which is what we're accredited with at the National Aquarium, as well as New England Aquarium. MIAS is a group, um, a colleague of mine. It's a diversity group that uh, began just in the last six months. Um, and let me get to make sure I have the right, give me a second. Diving with a purpose is that final um, flag logo um, for African-Americans. So just to give you some other diversity groups, again, this is certainly not everything, um, but a good smattering. So basically how to build towards an aquarium career. Certainly I mentioned a number of directions one can go in this field. I started out as an aquarist. My love of diving got coupled with it and that's the path I started moving towards. Um, most often when people ask me, how'd you get your start? I say, I volunteered. Um, volunteering and my internship really got my foot in the door and I just kept going with it. I said, a lot of people will tell you the same thing or in the aquarium business. Don't discount your extracurricular activities. Uh, they matter as much as your degree because it shows variety and of, of other skill sets you have. Um, and, gives you, and also you have real life experience that are also pertinent to a position. As you get an experience in aquarium and zoos, you are, you know, there'll be opportunities to specialize. Be willing to take jobs while in college to build a resume and skill set. Working in smaller jobs during school can act as a stepping stone to a chosen, that's, you know, chosen field. We've had internships at New England um, from Northeastern University who did an internship with us and realized it wasn't a career for them. So that's okay too. You have to do that sort of stepping stone to realize where you would like to be. Um, many of us have different backgrounds to get where we are today. Gain contacts, obviously, by doing different positions and access to resources, including knowledgeable mentors. All of us in our lives have had either one a focused mentor or many mentors um, that are, you know, are crucial uh, with those contexts to moving to where you want to be. So what's expected as far as what you know, we're looking for when I'm looking to hire a dive safety officer or the aquarist? Um, for your degree, you know, biology, obviously angle is very helpful, um, some kind of science, scuba certification and dive experience. Usually for a dive safety officer, you really ultimately want to become an instructor because you want to have that level and that training experience. You'll see this on a lot of job applications, ability to lift to 50, 55 pounds, team player, also be able to work independently. Uh, obviously helpful to have the in volunteer internship experience, possess an affinity for animals, educational orientation and conservation ethic. I mean, again, that's a much most aquariums and zoos have that as they're in their mission statements. Ability to mentor and train staff and volunteers at all levels on scuba procedures. Um, I mentioned, I think already, ability to problem solve and troubleshoot. Um, again, mentoring and training staff and good communication skills. Pretty much a lot of these apply to most positions. Um, this here is just so that you have this as a resource. This is the logos that I, you saw a couple um, frames ago. So you have the actual sites. And then I started to do my own look around just to see the different colleges and universities um, you know, that have professional diver instructor degrees. Again, this is certainly not everything. There's commercial dive schools, but this is just what came up in a, in a search on Google because I was curious. And there's certainly various other places worldwide you can gain experience. And there's again, various commercial schools and other, other avenues. And so that pretty much wraps my talk. I just wanna say um, I've been really privileged to work in the industry I'm in to be able to marry that love. Again, I really thought I'd be a, a veterinarian working like tooting around, working at farm on big farms. I wanted to be James Harriet. For those of you who remember who James Harriet is, um, I would say if you have an opportunity, go to Sea Rovers, go to the show, uh, the clinic, go to workshops, go to the talks. Um, for me, it was instrumental in helping frame who I am and the people I know today and the contacts I have, including um, Ted and the other folks you're seeing talk here today. Um, and you got to see Rick who really worked his way up through to the, what he's doing now and his love of technical diving and, and history and wrecks. Um, so really take advantage and be willing to, you know, people are very happy to talk about diving. The di divers, one thing we like to do is talk about our diving. So be curious, you know, and look around and ask questions. Um, 
Next up, our speaker is Paul Cater Deaton, and he is a writer, uh, producer, director, and filmmaker. And he's going to talk to us about those aspects of um, producing films in the underwater world. Paul. Thank you, Tim. I, 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 I'm hearing thunderous applause. I'm imagining thundering, thunderous applause. Glad to see you. Um, my name is Paul Cater Deaton. I am an underwater filmmaker, uh, writer, producer, director, and cinematographer. I am also in the news gathering business. I do a lot of work with all the major networks, uh, CNN, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, never a dull moment. From the time I was in, uh, third or fourth grade, I already knew what I wanted to do for a living. I wanted to be a freelance photojournalist. I wanted to travel the world and get my passport stamped and write stories and take photographs about wonderful exotic places and ports of call and people and cultures and then bring them back through the pages of magazines and newspapers back then because I wasn't thinking beyond the printed medium. And I wanted to, like I said, travel around the world and, and carry, a, carry a camera bag with a Hasselblad camera in it and a bunch of rolls of two and a quarter inch film and flash bulbs and one of those little reporter's notebooks that you keep in the palm, in the palm of your hand. And I wanted to wear khaki. I wanted to go all over the place. And, and I, I realized that those are lofty goals for a nine-year-old, but lo and behold, it happened with an interesting plot twist. My pictures began to move. The words transitioned from being read and, and written to being spoken and often have music behind it. And I, I transitioned into uh, moving pictures, video and film. I got into the film and video business in 1978. I've worked on a whole bunch of movies. I've worked with loads of people. Um, Willie Nelson, Sissy Spacek. Um, I got drunk with Lee Marvin once. That was an adventure. Um, but of course, who has it? And it, it was just a really interesting, uh, it, it has been interesting and continues to be interesting. It's something that you can do uh, in, in your old age and something I into, intend to do into my old age, which should be any day now. Um, when I was six years old, I was being, I was raised on a, on a ranch in Texas. I am from Texas and my, one of my favorite shows was Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges as Mike Nelson. And I was watching an episode of the show and Mike was in a fight underwater with a bad guy. And the bad guy busted out the face mask of his, uh, the, the, the face plate of his mask. And so I thought, well, it's all over for Mike Nelson now, but not Mike Nelson. He, he took his dive knife and cut the guy's air hose. And so the guy had to go to the surface, but Mike reached up and grabbed his mask and put it on his own face. And I thought, well, that's not gonna do you any good. It's all full of water. Then he did the most amazing thing. He tilted his head back, lifted the bottom of the mask, blew air out of his nose and the water cleared. And I thought, well, I just wonder if that would really work. And so I grabbed a mask because we always had them in the, and the streams and brooks and rivers and lakes and even the Gulf of Mexico, which was only about an hour and a hour and a half down the road. And I ran out to what was the closest body of water, which was the cattle trough next to the barn. It's still there. You can see it on Google Earth. And it's a, a, a concrete enclosure about 12 foot by 12 foot and three foot deep. And so against my mother's protestations, I jumped into this delectable blend of branch water and cow spit, flooded my mask, tilted my head back, lifted the bottom of the mask, blew air out of my nose, and it worked. And I was like, well, I will just be dipped. And lo and behold, that innocent little moment in time led to a life of adventure I could never have imagined. 
as a six year old little cowboy growing up in Texas on a ranch. So consequently, I've, I've traveled around the world, still do, not so much right now, but that's about to change by golly. Um, I've, I've shot on, uh, on six continents. Uh, the seventh, I, I'll be okay if I don't ever get to go to, to Antarctica. I, I have a colleague over here that's gonna speak in a moment who, who could probably have something to say about that because I think she's been there and loves it. Um, but I, I, it, it's, it's a wonderful career being a photojournalist and a filmmaker in, in an underwater environment and, and places that lend themselves to underwater environments, the countries, the, the cultures, the social strata, the whole thing is just fascinating. And there are so many things that you can do with it, which is why we're here talking about career opportunities in, in uh, the marine milieu. So um, what I'll do, we'll, we'll run uh, a, an eight and a half minute uh, kind of compendium of some of the work that I've done around the world and I'll come back and talk about it in a little bit more detail and then open for questions. So um, I believe that we have a clip. Be back in a minute. It has audio. Yeah. Let's... It's beautiful, isn't it? But like so many other things of exquisite beauty, this one is stirring up some major concerns. The waters of the Western Atlantic, including the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean, are witnessing the emergence of an invasive species, Tarawas volatans, the lionfish, a bold, voracious predator with a mane of venomous spines capable of rendering a sting fatal to some marine species and excruciatingly painful to humans. They are indigenous to the Indo-Pacific, Introduced into these waters either by accident or neglect or both, the spread of the lionfish here has been downright viral. The Great Wall is one of the signature dive sites of the Cayman Islands. The lush coral reef system off Little Cayman's north side is part of a marine protected area inhabited by a splendid array of sea life. Diving along the top of the reef, we are in about 50 feet of water. About 100 feet from shore, a sheer wall plunges over 1,000 feet straight down. On the dive deck of Cayman Aggressor just above us, a 90-year-old living legend straps on his scuba gear, grabs a camera, and drops in right on top of it. When you go to work on a shark boat, you learn to become a mouth breather really fast. You can be on the bow of a 36-foot dive boat, making 12 knots into a 15-knot headwind, and your nose will still let you know the exact moment the chum box is open back at the stern. In the parlance of the street, this stuff could gag a maggot. But to these beauties, it's absolute ambrosia. Tiger Beach is not really a beach at all. Situated some 25 miles off the west end of Grand Bahama, 
It comprises a sand shelf that rises to within 15 to 30 feet of the surface. Local fishermen have known about the place for generations. Shark fin soup. For centuries, it was considered a delicacy reserved for the Chinese aristocracy. But with the emergence of a middle class in China, it became more popular. And as a result, the prices and the popularity have skyrocketed. Some people, as I said, are superstitious, and a lot of them are corrupt and cruel. They think absolutely nothing of hauling a shark aboard a ship, slicing off all of its fins, and then kicking it back into the water while it's still alive to one of the most gruesome deaths imaginable because they think it brings good luck at a wedding. Yeah, mazel tov. It's supposed to impress. But if you really want to impress somebody with sharks, come down here with me and do this. That's me working. Or do this. Well, maybe not this. I want to close with one of my favorite shots. I filmed this at Tiger Beach in the Bahamas. Obviously, this tiger shark is big enough that it could bite my friend Vinny right in half, but she gets her little treat, and then she turns to Vinny and gets a little head scratch. It's like, oh, who's a cute little predator? Who's a cute little apex predator? Yeah, you are. When you think about it, it didn't take us very long at all to cause almost irreparable damage to our planet, and we weren't even paying attention. Imagine what we could do if we set our minds to it. Thank you. So David Jacques Cousteau, in fact, inspired him so much that he spent his career traveling all around the world. And, and then the let them age underwater in a very constant year-round temperature and relative darkness. And it's just a perfect idea, a perfect situation, and it's very, uh, it's got a historical component. Fascinating place, yeah. and I love me some Croatia. Yeah, I love the whole No, we are not swimming through the blacklight poster section at Spencer's. It's not an alien landscape. But now, modern lighting technology allows us to see corals in, well, a different light. Welcome to the fascinating world of coral fluorescence. Flash forward to the west bank of the Nile. Here in Thebes, across the river from Luxor, our ride is waiting. <laughs> Using more hot air than you're likely to find at a congressional debate, our gondolas go airborne. In the distance, the mortuary temple of the enigmatic Queen Hatshepsut. All too soon, we are on extended final for a wheat field just in time for lunch. And a party. So that was a compendium of some of the things that I've done over the years, some of my favorite memories. It's a wonderful thing to uh, 
to be able to travel around the world and do this work and, and quite often get paid for it. I like the mathematics of it all. Uh, what you just saw was the, uh, the title sequence for the film that I did called uh, Finding Nemo's Garden. It's, uh, it, it's a place in, uh, in Italy that's a very interesting uh, underwater farming experience uh, experiment. Do you have something you need to place? Okay. And um, it, it's uh, in the Ligurian uh, part of, uh, of Italy in a town uh, right offshore from a town called Noli. It's very, very interesting. You can find all or most of this stuff on my website, which is polcaterdeaton.com. If you wrote down the number that was on that card at the end of that clip, uh, you'll be getting somebody else because that's my old old number from the Virgin Islands and I live in uh, back in Texas now. But look look up Paul Cater Deaton, P-A-U-L-C-A-T-E-R-D-E-A-T-O-N.com and you can see a whole bunch of things. The second bit that you saw was from Lionfish, The Beautiful Outlaw, which aired on PBS. I did that film uh, 15 years ago, maybe 12, 15 years ago. And um, I, I really liked the film a whole lot. Uh, thankfully, as I suspected, it didn't turn out to be a doom and gloom story like so many people were saying, oh, there's not gonna be anything left in the Caribbean but jellyfish and, and, and algae. It's, it didn't turn out that way. Um, the last hurrah was about the final dives of uh, my, my good friend and mentor, Stan Waterman, who after about 50 or so years, probably more than that, of diving and making films under the sea, went on his last dive trip. Uh, we left, I think the day, one or two days after his 90th birthday. And after that trip, he hung up his fins. And I've learned so much from, from that man. Um, just an extraordinary fellow. He, he studied under Robert Frost when he was at Dartmouth and he has, he has a, a, a vocabulary that I think uh, it would be hard to, to find an equal uh, anywhere in the, in the country. He's an extraordinary fellow and, and uh, at 98, he's still with us, but no longer diving. Um, Showdown at Tiger Beach is a black and white homage to Lloyd Bridges, Sea Hunt and the, the black and white films of my youth. You know, those thrilling days of yesteryear. Um, there's great value, I think, in nostalgia. That's one of the things that we can talk about. And uh, if I remember after I talk about these other films, uh, we'll talk about it. Um, that led to uh, a clip from a, a TED talk that I gave uh, on St. Thomas about um, shark finning and essentially the, the many dangers facing the shark populations in our country, uh, in, our, in our planet. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's atrocious, it's horrendous what's going on. And it's all, you know, for greed, corruption, and money. And I, I don't have the time to talk about why it's a really bad idea to just go out and wantonly kill like 70 million or 700 million sharks every year for a soup that probably tastes really bad. Um, but the, the, the information's out there and it doesn't lie. You can look it up and find out why it's a really bad idea. After that was a clip from Great Day Houston, uh, north of where I live. I live on an island called Galveston on the Gulf Coast of, uh, of Texas. <clears throat> That's one of the valuable things that we can all do as scuba divers to help people understand what's at stake at the very least, make them understand what we have to lose if we continue on the path that we are as humans, um, and, and the, the trajectory currently just doesn't look very good at all. Uh, I hate to kind of portend doom and gloom, but if we don't change some things very quickly and very significantly, we're gonna be in, uh, in, in serious trouble as, uh, as uh, people who live on this planet and every other living thing on the planet is in jeopardy because of what we as humans have done over just a couple of years. We have undone that which took nature hundreds of millions of years to perfect. How dare we? 
Um, after that was uh, uh, the opening sequence from Secrets of the Psychedelic Reef, talking about uh, the fluorescence of corals, which is a fascinating subject. You can find that on my website as well. And then finally, a clip from Night Train to Cairo, which I filmed in, I believe, 2005. I've been to the Red Sea three times and, and just love it. Uh, people go, oh, well, I would never go there today. Well, they said that back when I first went in 2001, no, 2002, about uh, six months after 9-11. And, and they, they all, my friends and family thought I'd lost the keys to my brain. And, and I, I felt wonderful the whole time. We were very well cared for. Uh, the hands were outstretched to greet us everywhere we went. There was almost a sense of, of sorrow and sadness expressed by, by some of these people when they would take our hands and, you know, sir, you are welcome, you are welcome. And it just proves that not everybody is out to, to kill everybody else. You know, there, it, it, there's a really wonderful world out there and doing what we do is a portal to these, these extraordinary places. Over the last 50 years or so, it's, uh, it's been my honor to do a lot of work with a lot of uh, uh, networks and, and film companies and so forth, to name a few. Uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, CMT, MTV, Bravo, Travel Channel, Discovery Channel, HBO Documentaries, Nat Geo Wild, The Amazing Race, and even Wheel of Fortune. That's right, you heard that correctly. Just yesterday, uh, an episode of, of Wheel of Fortune uh, show, played in, uh, on TV across the nation. Consequently, I've gotten a lot of emails and, and texts and uh, IMs from people, dude, we just saw you on, on Wheel of Fortune. And, and that comes from a, uh, a promotional video that I had produced for a uh, beach resort on, uh, on uh, St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. And uh, being the producer and director, you can put yourself into the movies sometime. And so I, there's a dining and, uh, and toasting sequence uh, with my girlfriend and me. And so, uh, you know, we have our 15 seconds of fame. <laughs> um, sometimes the news isn't good, as I've said. Uh, uh, there, People just go, gosh, you know, the, the, the problems are so overwhelming. What can one person possibly do? Well, as I've said, at, at, the, at a lot of the places where I've been a speaker, and I'm going to say it Sunday at, I believe, 930 at Boston Sea Rovers up in Danvers. By ourselves, we are but a drop in the ocean. But together, we are the ocean. If you if you combine your resources and just get together with people and talk and make and discuss and, and go out and do a beach cleanup or uh, you don't have to go on television and talk about things, but you can certainly share information with your friends, try to lift the level of your awareness about what's going on in the in the world with regard to climate change and global warming and rising uh, rising seas and, and everything else. It, it, at least knowing about it helps to understand what we can do about it. So uh, I'll close with the most common question I, I get, you know, well, what, what do you, if somebody wants to be an underwater filmmaker or a journalist or whatever, what do you, what do you recommend uh, about how to get started in such a thing? Or, you know, what are your, what's your tips? People always expect me to give them camera tips or some sort of compositional something. My advice, take a business class and get good at it. Everybody has something that they can do and do well and something that they love, but turning it from a hobby into a vocation that, that makes a living for you is gonna take some semblance of knowledge of, uh, of business. So take a business class. Continuing education is always a good thing. Uh, I'm 68 and I still do it. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I uh, uh, took some coursework in global shark conservation 
and uh, bi uh, biodiversity and biology through Cornell University and the University of Queensland. And I keep I keep doing that thing, th those kinds of things to, to stay sharp and to know more about it <coughs> so that hopefully I can help people understand more about the subjects and about our underwater world. And uh, inshallah, we'll be able to someday look behind us and go, wow, you know, it worked. We saved the planet. So again, by ourselves, we're but a drop in the ocean, but together we are the ocean. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hope to see you at Boston Sea Rovers, but get out there and learn things and do some wonderful stuff. Thank you so much. All right, next up we have Faith Ortiz. She is also a Sea Rover as well as a Women Diver Hall of Fame inductee. Um, and she's had a, a very career that she's going to tell us about. Um, and her latest uh, career path is um, as a uh, ecotourism um, company. Um, so she'll talk to us about that. But she's had some other endeavors in her in her past, and she will explain that to us now. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ted. Okay, thank you all very much for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk with young people about ocean conservation and marine careers and all the various possibilities. I think uh, the speakers today have already talked to you a little bit about all the, so many possibilities. It's actually amazing uh, of what you can do in uh, regarding to the ocean. If you're listening to this, it probably means that you love the water. Uh, maybe you're interested in diving, maybe you're not a diver yet, but you like the idea of, of doing it. Uh, you want to protect the ocean. I think a lot of people have that in common, uh, but you don't necessarily maybe know how to do it and how to go about doing it as a career. Uh, my niece is 16 years old and she's kind of in that same boat right now. And she's really stressed over the idea of trying to figure out what she wants to be when she grows up. And I, I told her to let me know when she figures it out because maybe she can help me figure that out too. Um, but uh, yeah, because I've done, done a lot of different things in my career and uh, as Ted talked about. So I, I've, but I've always looked at it this way. It's, it, I made a decision when it came, comes to, uh, you know, wanting to uh, find a career. I wanted to find a career that emb embodied my passions because I wanted to be able to make that passion my uh my career and not, because you're going to be doing a lot of spending a lot of time doing your job and i wanted it to be something i really loved other people kind of take a different approach and say hey you know i want to make enough money that i can pursue my passions uh and have the cash to pursue my passions and my free time uh, but i kind of decided to go the other way and, and marry that and and i think uh that's what i kind of want to talk about a little bit today and, and make sure that if you kind of want to do that as well, maybe here's some ways of approaching it and thinking about how you want to make this decision and then hopefully eventually end up uh, in a successful career um, in, the, in the marine world. So, so very early on, I discovered that my passion was about educating people about the ocean, getting them engaged in the ocean by diving and learning more about the critters in it and keeping them engaged by helping them explore new kinds of diving uh, and new places in the ocean. And, and so I was a dive store owner for quite some time. Uh, after being a dive store owner, I got involved as a uh, manufacturer of scuba equipment, uh, but I was never really a salesperson, okay? I never thought of myself that way. Instead, what I thought of myself as, as an educator who was trying to bring people closer to the ocean so that maybe they would also protect it because they would also love it like I do. Okay, so that was kind of my philosophy. People protect what they love and I wanted them to be motivated to protect the ocean. Uh, so I went through a bunch of different iterations of trying to do that. And, uh, and, and you will too, okay? And that's okay, you know, to try that different things like that. You know, uh, that is definitely okay. Uh, okay, so, so my three E's are educate, engage and explore. And that starts with you, your personal journey. Uh, you know, Holly was talking about not just using book learning and, and but to try different experiences, have mentors, learn from other people. You'd be amazed at how many other people are out there who are willing to help and give you some of uh, the benefit of their experience. And it, it, Boston Sea Rovers is a great place to do that if you're from this area. Uh, you certainly will meet some incredible people. And so by doing those things and doing that, taking your own journey 
to discover what you need, uh, you'll be able to find your passion, okay, and find what works for you. What are you excited about? What do you, can you spend, imagine spending the rest of your life doing? And a variety of formats maybe, but all in the same idea of pursuing that passion, which for me, as I said, was finding a way of getting people to engage with the ocean in such a way that it changed their lives. I wanted to be able to change people's lives and change people's perspectives. Uh, and so from going from a dive store owner where I would educate people about diving, sell them dive gear, teach them diving uh, and become an instructor, uh, whether I was a, when I was a manufacturer of dive equipment, I was selling them the tools they needed to go and do different kinds of diving, uh, especially more involved diving. And then uh, more technical diving, deeper diving, colder water diving. Uh, but as a, a few years ago, I began, uh, created a company that took people diving to unusual places. So the idea was to give pe take people to places that most people don't go to. And a big part of that was that I wanted to be able to engage them in a way that was a little different, okay? I wanted them to see places that maybe they don't know about. So for example, a lot of the places we take people uh, on my, in my company are the places where the science is, it, there's a lot of important scientific work going on there on research on climate change or uh, coral reef restoration or other aspects of, of ocean conservation that we can teach people about. Sometimes it's just showing them the benefits of what we can do. Yeah. Let's try that. All right. Okay. Hi there. Sorry about the technical difficulties here. So there'll be a little blank spot on the screen. I apologize, but at least we got it not covering up the, uh, the uh, words for this case. So the, um, every time you block it, it seems to hide it. It seems to be the problem. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I don't think you can do it. So don't worry about it. It's fine. Well, let's just keep on moving. Okay. So, so for me, education and exploration lead to engagement with people and helping, helping them find their passion for the ocean. So for you to do the same thing with your education, try new things, take classes outside your normal major, ask lots of questions uh, and, and look for mentors who can provide fresh perspective and opportunities for new experiences and take advantage of opportunities. So you never know where that opportunity may come from for you to find what you love and, you know, and don't be about afraid of turning your life's, uh, your passion into your life's work. Okay. Let's see what happens. Okay, let's give this one more try here. So by t if you're gonna turn your passion into a career, your first step will obviously be to become a subject matter expert. So now in my case, as being a uh, leader of eco tours around the world to mostly to remote places, what do I need to be an expert in? So, well, I need to be an experienced diver with training as a dive instructor and special training in rescue and dive safety because obviously we're in remote places. We need to be able to respond if there is an emergency appropriately. And you don't necessarily want to rely 100% on the people that you're diving with. You need to have some control over that yourself. And of course, you want to be able to be an instructor to help people who are maybe newer divers but also experience this environment in a safe way. You also need a pretty broad knowledge about, uh, about a wide range of diving versus a really narrow focus. So you saw uh, today, earlier today, there was a presentation by, um, by someone who was doing a lot of technical diving. That's, he's an incredibly knowledgeable technical diver, but he doesn't necessarily know about a broad range of diving in different parts of the world. And that's important to know if you're gonna be leading tours in different places. And not just the dining, but also about the geographical issues of traveling there. That becomes particularly important nowadays with COVID. Now I've had to become an expert on border border issues and border procedures, and uh, and how to deal with uh, airlines that have different protocols for different uh, for COVID, uh, rule, hotels that have different uh, rules. Uh, and of course, if you're deal setting up these tours, you have to do all parts of it, the flights, the hotels, the transfers. So you need to be really good at managing logistics. So it's quite, you need to become an expert in a lot of different things. Uh, so maybe it's a little bit more of a, a jack of all trades, but I mean, not quite a master of none, uh, you know, a little bit of a combination there. So these, all of these things are really important. And the, and when you, when you uh, go about learning them, hopefully you can then share that experience with other people in a better way. So for example, you want to take people to a place where 
marine protected areas have done an incredible job at protecting reefs, like in the Maldives. Uh, they're trying very hard to protect their reefs. They're doing a fantastic job that some of the things, unfortunately, are out of their control because of climate change issues. And uh, they're, they're having such a horrible problem with the temperature uh, of the water rising, rising there. And that's not in something they can control. But the part they can control, they're trying to do by keeping the reefs safe. In Cuba, they're trying to protect uh, the reefs off of Garda the Queens. And this is a place where you can still see healthy populations of sharks. I don't think you can see anything like this uh, in any other parts of the Caribbean. Uh, so you have not only healthy reefs, but also the, the shark population being really healthy. It's just amazing. In the Azores, you have a recovery of the blue sharks, you know, which used to be hunted uh, dramatically and have now been protected there. And uh, these, these small islands in the Atlantic have now brought the population back. And it's really impressive to see the, uh, that you can dive with these amazing oceanic animals, uh, just you know, uh, relatively reliably without, uh, without any trouble. And of course, going to Guadalupe off of Mexico, you might be able to dive with great white sharks and, and show people that sharks aren't the scary things. Okay, sharks are something you should be excited to see diving, not afraid of seeing diving. And I think that exposure like this has really changed how people look at sharks. I mean, 20 years ago, I don't think I could have uh, would have thought that young people were, were uh, talking with people about sharks aren't the enemy, they're not the problem. We need to protect sharks. You know, I never would have thought that people would be doing that uh, you know, and, and regular people who just weren't divers even. Divers, I think, have always loved sharks, but uh, uh, even non-divers have gotten into that now. You know, there are places in the world like Galapagos where you can still see massive groups of fish like this. Massive groups of fish and it's time that is blocked by the fish, by the schooling fish. And, they, and sharing these places with people gives them a new appreciation for what the possibilities are. This is a reef in Tasmania at 130 feet, 60 degree water, and it looks like a tropical reef, you know, and it's just unbelievable. All because they protected their reefs. A place that you never would have thought about having well protected and well populated reefs is almost. And just look at all those fish. This is the Arabian Sea. And these places are places that you have a hard time finding on a map. So we're trying to expose to them and show them that there are places where we hope to live out and, and get encouragement from that we haven't uh, ruined our oceans beyond repair. Part of this is going to, if you're going to be successful in any of these careers, is your ability to communicate. First of all, in what I do, uh, interpersonal skills are pretty important. First of all, you better like people, <laughs> okay, because you're spending a whole lot of time taking people on trips and engaging with people on a day-to-day -day basis, and, uh, and uh, people from a wide part of the, in our case, all over the world, but different backgrounds, and you need to be able to communicate well with them. Uh, and, and enjoy their company. Uh, that's what it's all about. That includes written communication, uh, everything from writing a good email or designing a flyer and, and having good information on the flyer. We write an expedition manual for all of our trips. So we have to actually be able to do that and be clear and concise with that. Um, be comfortable making verbal pr uh, you know, presentations like this, you know, whether it be a presentation to the group that you're working with or a presentation to 100 people at a, pres at a dive show. You know, uh, those are challenges and, and not everybody's comfortable with that. An ability to work with people from different places. Uh, that isn't just the customers that you're dealing with, but also the, the both people on the dive boats that you're working with. You need to be really comfortable with that. I think one of the classes, the, the classes that I took uh, during college that were surprisingly helpful in this career are my psychology classes. Um, I, you know, it was a psychology sub major in, in school, and uh, and I think I've learned a lot. You know, a lot of my, what I got there, I'm using in my career now. You know, and I didn't think I would actually. You know, so one of the things in, in terms of for me is is trying to engage people. So so I take people diving in and show them these amazing animals to try to get them to engage the ocean 
but also to engage the animal. Because if we have a personal connection with an animal, it, it, it changes the whole dynamic of things. This is the weedy sea dragon from Tasmania. And it is absolutely beautiful. And we hang out with them for an entire dive. And it's incredibly cooperative. And you suddenly have a connection to that animal. Maybe you have a connection, you, you, you watch a personal moment between two cuttlefish, or in this case, four cuttlefish, having a very personal moment. Uh, you know, and that's now that's a connection when you're when you're watching that, right? You know, uh, this is actually the cuttlefish mating in the hormone. It, it was awesome. So it sounds a little strange to say it's great to watch these other animals mating, but you know, it, it's just it had the privilege of seeing something like that. It's pretty impressive. And sometimes the animals want to engage with you. And that is just such an incredible experience to be able to share with people. For me, one of my favorites is the giant Pacific octopus. Uh, this is up in British Columbia, Canada. And these guys will play with you. They're curious, they're smart. And they're incredibly tactile. They want to touch things. And that means you as well. So the thing that's great about that is, can you imagine having this experience with an octopus? What are the odds that you're ever going to want to eat an octopus again? Okay, probably pretty low, right? So, so obviously, we've suddenly created a group of people that aren't going to uh, use look at this animal as a resource, but as a friend in the water. Similarly, with the wolf eels, uh, the wolf eels are actually protected up in British Columbia, and divers are one of the major reasons because these ugly-looking five to eight feet long animals that are eat sea urchins are just the, the cutest things and they love people. And the divers got so engaged with them uh, that they actually started a big campaign to protect them and take them off the restaurant menus. And they were successful. And you can see this is a wolf eel. You just get a good idea of the size of, of this one as a male. And, and he actually followed that diver around for the entire dive and wouldn't leave her alone. And God forbid she tried to take a picture of something else. I mean, she, it, it got, right, got right in the way of her camera. No, 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 you're playing with me. You're my human today. And uh, it's just having that engagement is an amazing thing. You know, looking in the eye of animals like that, you know, the mobile arrays and the Azores or the mantis off of Socorro. You know, you see these animals in their nature and, and you see them interact with you and choose to interact with you. It changes the way you think of things. Waddell seal in Antarctica. It's at three feet of water, just standing there with the camera in the water. And it came over to check us out. One of the scientists there was like, don't bother the seal, don't scare the seal away. I don't think we worried about scaring the seal away. It just would not leave us alone the whole time. It's absolutely adorable. These are the deepest diving seals in the world. This is a seal that gets a lot of bad reputation, the leopard seal, you know, being very dangerous. You know, look at this, look at this interaction between the the snorkeler and the dive and the seal. I mean, that that's a life-changing moment for that guy. And this is uh it's swimming around playing with us. Yes, that's I call that playing. Yeah. And beautiful water. 34, 32 degrees, but beautiful. <laughs> uh, seals, you, can, you don't have to go to Antarctica to play with seals. You can do that around here, for, for example. You can do that in a lot of different places. One of my favorite places is Hornby Island. These are the stellar sea lions. This one laid down in front of our friend Sue and, and rubbed up against her like a cat. You know, and, uh, and here she is petting it. And, that's a love bite. Then they get really interested. One of them says, hey, this guy's a, not a good diver. You know, let's go take a look at him. The riot act on the safety stop. Yeah, they can't, you, they'll, they'll walk Polly right up to the boat. <laughs> you know. Uh, water is about 46 degrees. So, yes, yeah, definitely a dry suit weather. This is actually a, uh, a whole bunch of them that found me on the bottom. I'm actually in the middle of that. Uh, and uh, that's me trying to kind of, okay, just don't take my mask off. You know? And these guys are 300 pound Labrador puppies wanting to play with you. And uh, so you give people those experiences, 
they become very passionate about what you're passionate about. You can share that passion with people. Now, what else do you need to know? Well, it isn't all fun and games, right? So you need to have some excellent organizational skills. Uh, I did a lot of training in project management because you need to have a project plan for your expedition. Uh, and that's useful in a lot of different aspects of marine careers. But, you know, certainly what I'm doing now, you need to have that. Uh, the devil is in the details. Okay, I think anybody who's a diving safety officer would agree with me on that one too. Logistics can make or break a trip. They can make or break an experience for people. Uh, it's really important to, to think of all the possible things that can happen and have a contingency for that. But no matter what you do, the key is flexibility and the ability to adapt while juggling a whole bunch of things at once. Uh, you know, so some people that's, uh, that's overwhelming, uh, other people that just gets them all jazzed up and ready to go for another day. Uh, I'm crazy enough to be in that latter categories, but if, you, if you're into that too, then that might be something that would work for you uh, as a career. One of the most logistically heavily uh, things that I do is work on polar expeditions. So uh, for challenges in organization, this is it, because you're dealing with a big boat, you're dealing with animals that are very unpredictable, you're dealing with the most unpredictable uh, weather in the world. And uh, boy, does that make things interesting. So this is actually the Spitsbergen and the Arctic uh, where we're actually doing an expedition to uh, look for polar bears, um, as well as other animals uh, around the ice and under the ice. Uh, getting able to be close to these guys. These are life-changing experiences for people. Seeing these kind of animals, seeing this kind of a place in, its in, in, uh, you know, in the real world, not in a zoo, uh, you suddenly become uh, real, really appreciative of their uniqueness and the fragile nature of their existence uh, and how quickly we're impacting it. This is ground zero for climate change. Uh, if you're if this, uh, something you're into, a topic you're interested in, you need to get to the poles. You need to see this view of the pack ice, see how broken up it is, see how challenging it is for the polar bears and the walruses to navigate it. And you will really be inspired to do what you can to, to slow that down. The ice is still there though, it's breaking apart. So, you know, we do get amazing icebergs from it. Uh, seeing an iceberg is just incredible. These are all icebergs in Antarctica. Uh, where they tend to be much larger because the ice is much thicker. And you get a chance to dive on them if you're properly trained for that. But seeing the icebergs is just mind blowing. And for many people, not only is it inspiring, it also turns you a little bit into like a little kid again. So, you know, everybody wants to climb up on top of an iceberg and jump off of one. It's kind of a rule. You have to do it when you can, you know, it, everybody just loves it. And people come back from seeing them and see and seeing the beauty of them and seeing the animals that live on them like these king penguins and i guarantee you it changes their lives and talk about engaging remember we talked about engaging with the animal the person engaging with the animal and having that have an impact on them this is doesn't get any better than that when a little penguin walks up to you right not too bad so what else do you need to do to, be a, to make this your career? Well, part of it's going to be these days, especially computer and internet skills. So learning how to do marketing, website development, work on social media. Uh, how do you use social media to keep your clientele engaged? Uh, database management software. So you can keep track of what your customers' uh, interests are and, and emails with them and communications with them. For me, this is a challenge, okay? This is not my strong suit. Uh, I went to college at a time when this was not the number one thing to do using computers. Um, and, and I've tried to stay current, but you know, as you can see by some of the difficulties we had today with my presentation, maybe not so well, you know? Um, but, the, but the bottom line is, is understanding what those limitations are. And then you bring in people to work with you that can balance out what you do. Uh, my business partner and I have very different skill sets. He's actually worse at this stuff than I am. So fortunately, we do have a guy who's very helpful with us that we works us part time on this stuff. But the uh, my business partner is a warm water person. He loves doing the warm water stuff. That's what his expertise is in. He knows uh, everything I could I could more than I could possibly imagine about warm water diving and the destinations. Whereas I'm more of a cold water diving destination person. And so we balance each other out really well. So that's not a bad thing either. You don't just have to know all of this yourself. Yourself, you just need to know how to get it, okay, and understand you need it. And understanding finances is a big thing. Uh, Paul mentioned the idea of taking a business class, and boy, I can't, I can't uh, 
tell you enough how much I agree with that. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges we have in the industry of diving and marine careers is that we have a lot of people who do this because they're passionate about it, which is great, but they forget they have to make money at it and, be a, and run a business. So, you know, developing a budget, understanding what your real costs are. People, you know, really don't, you know, do a good job of that. And a very big part of it is people don't do a very good job of valuing your time and expertise. Because there's a value to your, your time and expertise. And if you're a con contractor or a consultant and you need to put a, a dollar figure on how much you're worth per hour, most people underestimate themselves. Okay, not overestimate themselves, they underestimate themselves. Uh, so think about that. Think about what you really need to make as a, 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 for you to be successful and comfortable. Not to, you know, most people aren't going to go uh, uh, make a million in the diving industry, but <laughs> but and that's okay. But you do want you do need to be able to function, right? And you need to be able to to manage your career and have a family and and have a house and all that kind of stuff later on. Hopefully, you can do that. So I'm gonna end with a very short video about uh, our company. It kind of, it, it kind of describes uh, some of these things we've been talking about and encourage you to, uh, uh, to e let your journey to figure out what you wanna do evolve, cause that's okay. Uh, all life evolves, right? So we finish up with this. all about keeping divers diving by engaging them in unique dive experiences that make you want to do more diving and explore more of the world. It's all about getting out there and trying new destinations and trying new kinds of diving. Uh, we're trying to get Americans to get outside their box and dive in places that are unknown. Um, and new for them. Croatia, Oman, you know, uh, places deep in Indonesia, not just in the diving, but also in just in the ability to travel and understand they're, they're a world participant. Our focus is on true expeditions where we're exploring new places, trying new dive sites or new styles of diving, and really getting you immersed into the environment, both for diving and with the people. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our next and last speaker of today is uh, Bruce Strickrat, who is a head pilot for the Deep Submersible album at Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, and they're coming to us remotely from Woods Hole, from the deck of the Atlantis. So, Bruce, take it away. We, we thought we'd start with this great shot of the dive locker. And then I'm gonna show you a picture of what you're gonna see here in a minute. This is, this is Alvin about two weeks ago, right as we were taking it out of the high bay, which is just about a hundred yards from where we're standing. And we're gonna show you the actual sub, but I thought I'd start by showing you what it looks like when all the skins are on right before we brought it over to Atlantis. You're gonna see the sub here and a lot of those skins are off. So you get to see the, the behind the scenes stuff. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. I'm working with Ken Costell here at Hui and, and he's behind the camera. So he's gonna follow me around a little bit. I think the first thing we're going to do is show you the back deck, the view from Atlantis from the hangar, and uh, see how wonderful it is here in Woods Hole. We've got the uh, Sea Education Association sailing ship. Folks can go out and, and do classes on, on the Corvus Kramer. And then right around here on the left, you see the, the high bay where Alvin was put together over the last year and a half. And you can see the big blue A-frame that we use to launch and recover the sub. I think right now we'll spin back around and we, we got Alvin in the background and I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. My name is Bruce Strickrod. I've been with uh, the Alvin program for 25 years now, worked my way up uh, after getting a degree in ocean engineering and some time in the Navy uh, to be in a pilot for many years. I ran the operations at sea 
And then back in 2014 was promoted to managing the program. I still go out with the sub. I still dive it. And uh, I can tell you that from a career point of view, it's been totally amazing. It continues to be great. We always have our challenges, but working with Alvin and working at Woods Hole is truly a, a wonderful experience. And those of us that do it are really fortunate. And uh, I think we'll tell you a little bit about what the program does. And then we'll take a little walk around of the sub so you can actually see some of the technology that we use. I think the first thing to, to state is that Alvin's been around for 67 years, or 57 years, excuse me. I got to be careful there because Alvin's as old as I am and I'm 57 almost, I'm not 67. Anyway, 57 years, continuous operations with a few hiccups here and there. In 1968, it spent about 10 months on the bottom before they picked it back up again. But this vehicle and the program have been continually working and taking scientists down into the deep ocean. And about 25 years ago, when I started, there was a discussion about making Alvin go deeper and, and making a new high-tech sub. And we are literally on the, the doorstep of taking the, that version of Alvin out and diving it. We leave on October 15th, we head out to Bermuda, and we start our sea trials. Ultimately, by the end of the month, the end of this month, we're going to be taking Alvin down to about 22,000 feet, the deepest it's ever gone, with a brand new vehicle designed by a whole bunch of young engineers. Our team is a lot of young men and women that help work and design this vehicle from ground up, actually get to build it and then take it out and operate it. So for those of you thinking about engineering, this is what engineering will get you if you work hard. You can go out and play with the best toys on the planet and go to places that you probably never even dreamed about. And I've been doing that for 25 years and I would strongly advocate for people who like engineering to think about it because it'll, it'll take you to some amazing places. Let's get to know the vehicle a little bit. This is the front end of the sub. One of the most important pieces of equipment is missing, which is the basket where all the science happens. But you do get to see the rest of the sub. Here's our front end. We've got two shilling manipulators. One of these is brand new. We, we didn't have the hydraulic plant to run two of them. These are very high tech made by shilling robotics. Now we have two of them. That's a big deal. For those of us that run the sub, we've been waiting years to have these two really super dexterous arms on. I can't wait to try them out. We've got the three big windows that are covered with protective. These are just a protective cover that'll come off when we get underwater. This one doesn't look like a window because it isn't. And what it is is a plate. And next Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to have three people in the sub to do a life support test. The first day is 12 and a half hours on deck here in the, in the Atlantic, on the Atlantis to test the life support system. And then the next day, five and three quarters hours, three people in the sub are gonna wear the emergency breathing apparatus to make sure those work. That's our last critical milestone and it's the capstone, basically on a 25 year project to get the sub to 20 to 6,500 meters. And then off we go once the Navy gives us the green light, hopefully by the end of the week after next, we're gonna get a piece of paper from the Navy that says, okay, you can take it out and put people in it and stick it in the water. And again, we'll walk around a little bit. What I'll tell you is real quick, the first place we put the sub in the water will be hanging from the back of the ship on the A-frame and we'll dunk it down behind us and start doing systems tests while we're still tethered. And then little by little, we'll start taking it deeper and deeper. So back to Alvin, this is a brand new camera system, 4K. There's gonna be two of those and a whole suite of lights and cameras up on the front end. A lot of what we do is take images. We take uh, almost two terabytes of images every day underwater. It's a, it's a crazy amount of data, most of it video and still pictures. Uh, we've got a lot of cameras yet that we haven't installed. Brand new data system inside the sub. Really cool controls. It's like a spaceship inside. Touch screen displays, and we use iPad tablets to interact with the, the video system, to look at the video to do things like control the cameras. Three of us are in there, pilot sits in the front, and we have the science observers on either side. And they get this great view. And we're gonna come around to the starboard side of the sub. We also have windows on the side, so each of the observers gets two windows. Kind of nice when you're sitting in there, it's a, a kind of a scallop padded seat, it's quite comfortable. Uh, the, like I said, the inside looks like a, a spaceship and maybe I could send Ted some pictures that he could post. Uh, real high tech, a lot of switches too, because we need to have analog systems in case the computers decide to act up, which we all know happens. 
um, music. We're playing music all day long. We got a little lunch and off we go. And the way our dive day works with the sub, this is where it all happens overnight and into the morning of the dive, we prep the sub. And then by about uh, eight o'clock in the morning, we put it out on the back deck, fully skinned up, fully loaded and ready to go, put our three people in and we're underwater by 8 a.m. And uh, on a typical day, we're back up on the surface at five, recover it back in the hangar at 5.30. Everybody runs up to the mess decks to get dinner. And then by six o'clock, we're doing our post dive and the scientists are all around the front getting the samples. And we can do that every day for 28 days straight, which is pretty impressive. I've, I've done it before. We dive every day if we can. We're really looking at starting to do longer dives, which probably will impact our ability to dive every day. But it's not unusual for us to go out for three weeks and work every single day from about 5 a.m. to about 8 at night, putting Alvin in and out of the water with and rotating through our three to four pilot rotation. So again, engineering gets you out on the back deck of a research ship with one of the coolest machines on the planet. You get to work on it. You get to take it underwater eventually. You get to work with these great scientists. And you always have great stories to tell. Anyway, if you come around to the side, everything you see here is going to be covered with the skins. That's why I wanted to show you that first picture. All this equipment that you see is actually it actually gets wet. So the skin is just a protective covering. If Ken comes down a little bit, what you're looking at in here are the components of a brand new water ballast system. When you scuba dive, you use what's called a buoyancy control device and you use air to change your volume and, and get neutrally buoyant. Alvin uses this big chunks of white foam to float. And when we're down underwater, we need to have water in tanks to make us neutrally buoyant. And that's what this system is. We'll have about two to three, 400 pounds of water in there. And then as we start to bring samples on and we bring rocks on board, sometimes hundreds of pounds, we'll take some of that water and remove it and we'll keep the sub neutrally buoyant underwater. And I always ask this question to students, how much does the sub weigh? The answer underwater it doesn't weigh anything. It's neutrally buoyant. We hover over, over the bottom at a couple of meters. And then if we want to land, we'll bring water in and land. When we're on the bottom, typically we don't weigh more than about 50 pounds. So we were down there with scuba gear on. I'm a diver. We'd walk over. You could walk over and if you gave the sub a big enough shove, you might even be able to pick it up over your head, right? It has all the mass of a 40,000 pound machine, but underwater it doesn't weigh anything. So a lot of inertia when you get it going. It's like a, we, we say it's like an elephant on roller skates. And we fly Alvin around the bottom a lot like a spaceship. We, we fly in in three, three axes, X, Y, Z. We live in a three-dimensional world down there and you give it a push with the thrusters in the direction you want to go. We don't drive in these curves very well. So it's a lot like a spaceship. You get it moving through the water, you spin it around, you drive in another direction, we can drive it sideways, we can hold position up and down and we get to have this amazing view of the bottom. It's a front and center view. We're not looking at a camera, we're looking out of a window so you get the full binocular view out of your eyes. Anyway, this is all brand new, big deal for us because the old system was in since the 70s. Uh, a lot of this equipment still has to get tucked up. If you look up here, this is where one of our ballast tanks sits. And that's one of the tanks that keeps us on the surface when we start the dive. So this will all be covered. But what you're looking at behind the scenes here is you can see the back end of the personnel sphere, which is a six foot sphere made out of titanium and has been tested down to 8,400 meters. What you're looking at up here are the electrical and fiber optic signal carrying wires and, and, like I said, fiber optics that go inside the hull and allow us to pass data and signals back and forth through the hull. So those are very unique devices that have to be able to handle uh, what basically is a hole in the hull for each one of those. And we have to make sure when those are put together that they seal really well. The sub doesn't leak. It's a wonderful thing gets a little smaller underwater by about a 16th of an inch when we're down at the deep, deep dives. So the back end of the sub, we won't go too far back, we'll go up. This is an example of one of the, the lift props. We have thrusters on the sub. We have three that move us forward and backwards, two that lift us up and down, and two on the front and back of the sub that can spin us around or drive us sideways. Anyway, all this is going to be covered. It looks really clean when we get the skins on it. 
And as long as we don't put it in the hydrothermal vents, it stays pretty for a while, but it doesn't take long. We, we tend to bump into a thing here, here or there. We bump into the rocks. There's lots of structure down there. Let's go upstairs. I think one thing that's important is that we moved the sub back aboard about a week, two weeks ago, and we're still moving back on board Atlantis. Atlantis was away for a year doing a, a major refit uh, on its midlife, 30 year midlife. So there's still a lot of work going on to get us kind of reestablished on board the ship. But you can see the, the top end of the sub here. We call this the sail. That's where we climb in and out of the sub. There's a big 21 inch hatch, about three, a little over three inches thick titanium. When the sub is out in the apron, when we're getting ready to launch, three of us climb in, we eventually shut the hatch, and then off we go into the water. Uh, one of the best jobs, other than going in the sub, is swimming with it. We get to swim with the sub and uh, hook it up and unhook it in the morning and in the evenings. And it's really nice to be off the ship uh, swimming around in the water. Uh, we like to say that uh, those of us that swim with Alvin get to swim in the deep end of the pool because there's no bottom. Well, you're at 20 some thousand feet. You're hanging out you're swimming out in the middle of the open ocean. And uh, we don't think about that too much. Normally the water's about 80 degrees, so it's really fun. And then every other couple of days you get to take a dive in the sub, which is great. A couple other things up here, this big T, this big titanium T, that's how we pick the sub up and drop it in the water. There's a really big piece of, of uh, line, we don't call them ropes, with a big eye around it. It's about this thick, it weighs about eight pounds a foot dry. And that hooks around the T, and that's what lifts the 40 some thousand pound sub in and out of the water. And we pull it up into the A-frame, it, it marries up inside the, the yellow frame of the back, and there's a big hook that gets into that slot on the T. And that's how we keep it secure as we bring it in and out uh, on board the ship and then roll it back off in the, in the mornings when we launch. But uh, not more than about uh, three months ago, the sub was completely disassembled. And it was all in pieces, some of which hadn't even arrived from the vendors. And we were getting pretty nervous about getting it all put back together. But uh, the team did an amazing job bringing it uh, back together. And watching the sub come together is a pretty amazing thing, particularly when you know you have a deadline and it's owned by the Navy and they've got to run you through all the tests to get it done. I think we can walk over and kind of just take a peek down, down the hatch so you can see what it looks like from the top. You're probably not gonna see an awful lot, but you can see the hatch here. It's got a protective cover on it. This is our ventilation. We like to keep the sub cooled and ventilated when it's in the hangar. Uh, if you look straight down, you can see the ladder in the back. The ladder comes out. All of our life support is in the back back end of the sub over here. On the port and starboard side are the equivalent of small video recording studios where we get to see all the video and all the science information that's coming in. And then the front end is where all the fun happens. Uh, the pilot sits in the middle. There, are, Like I said, you can't see them, but there's a you can just barely see the pilot's touchscreen there. We have a, we have a, that's actually the uh, pilot's console. And right above that are three really big touch screens where we interact with a lot of the systems on the sub. We can do things like we can see sonars. We have sonars that, that send sound out in front of us. And we use that to, to find structures out far away from us. We get a lot of the video feeds that can come up in front of us. All sorts of information on the vehicle systems. The, the sub I started with had almost exclusively switches. And the only screens that we had were little black and white TVs. Now we have these amazing interactive systems. We have one that's navigation. It looks just like the nav screen in your car. You can put targets in, you can get ranges and bearings. You can see where you are relative to the target. You can see where Atlantis is. So as we come up, we get the, the differences between the two. Anyway, I, it's the, the best part about this, of course, is being able to get in it and dive and sitting in there for eight or nine hours learning about science from the scientists. So I think at this point, we'll probably head back down to the front of the sub 
Ted, I don't know whether there's any opportunity for people to ask questions, but I'm certainly available to do so. I don't know if you heard me. Did you hear me? Yeah, I did. Um, I don't see any questions. Hopefully I wasn't that boring. Popping up. No, actually, uh, <laughs> in, in this case, um, we didn't get a lot of participants, unfortunately. We, we had people registered, but they just didn't sign up. So we are recording right. this, and it's going to be posted on um, Salem States and also uh, Boston Zero's website. So. Well, maybe somewhere out there is a person who wants to be an engineer and yeah. wants to come and work, come and work with us. Because, and we'll uh, have, yeah, and we'll have your contact information, um, you know, posted with the with the recording and stuff. So, so you may get some questions later on, but um, well, for what it's worth, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yes, no, I, I enjoyed it. It was great, um, and the other presenters did as well. Um, well, thank you guys for uh, for setting this up and. Um, and uh, the Boston Sea Rovers thank you, and uh, and I thank you personally. Yeah, and I, I hope to uh, I hope to come to the to a real Sea Rover convention again in the future. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll have to tag you for a for one of the presentations at the show. It'd be great. Yep. We'll have, we'll have well, I'll, I'll send you a heads up when we're when we're out there diving. Okay. Excellent. Pretty soon. All, All right. right. On that, we'll, I guess we'll sign off. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. That wraps up our uh, symposium today. Um, I hope you all um, can join Sea Rovers um, with our show this weekend. Um, and certainly um, these will be available as recordings. So you can uh, check back and uh, contact our speakers um, with specifics about their careers. And certainly we want to uh, make sure that you're uh, informed on what you need to do. Um, and. Uh, Hopefully we'll see you at the show and on behalf of the Boston Sea Rovers and Salem State University, um, thank you for attending. Yeah.